I want to bring a little cosmological perspective to this. Uh, and uh, quantum mechanics, of course, is an incredibly successful theory, arguably the most successful theory of physics we've had so far. During the century plus since its inception, it's given us amazing technologies. And uh, just the other week, I was talking with David Wineland, who holds in my book the record for the most precise measurement ever in science. He has measured a certain period of time to 17 decimal places. 17 decimal places, quite remarkable, confirming certain predictions of quantum mechanics, and yet we still argue about it, what it means, which is why we're having this workshop. So before I tell you what I think it means, I want to ask you, just very briefly, what you think it means. So first of all, in this little Insta poll here, do you believe that new physics violating the Schrodinger equation will make large quantum computers impossible? Raise your hand for yes. I count one hand. Raise your hand for no. One, two, three, I'm going to do this way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Raise them high. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. And undecided, we'll figure out later by counting how many there are in the room and subtracting the interest of time. All right, so that was a, pr a pretty strong majority for no. Now, do you believe that isolated systems, that all isolated systems obey the Schrodinger equation or evolve unitarily? Yes. Okay, I, okay I'll raise my hand too. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Is that a hand? No. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, and 22 there in the back. Okay, who is for no? Okay, it's easier to count. I have one and two. Three, three. The back ventures count two. Three, no. How about... <laughs> Now, which view of quantum mechanics is closest to your own here? So you can take your own interpretation of these, and if it's not on there, vote for the last one. Who is for Copenhagen here, including the postulate of explicit wave function collapse? Copenhagen. <laughs> one. <laughs> Anyone else? Raise your hands pretty high, because I don't want to miss anybody. Two. Okay, going once, going twice for coping. Okay, that's two. Modified dynamics. So the Schrodinger equation is modified to give some kind of explicit collapse. For example, George Rimini Weber, as we heard about from Simon Saunders. Going once, going twice. Okay, zero. You're taking this down, may I, right? Uh, what about many worlds? No collapse. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen, and fifteen. All right. Fifteen. What about um, consistent histories? Whoa. Okay, zero. What about Bohm? Okay, you, um, one, two, three, four, five. An interesting spatial clustering <laughs> of the, <laughs> the bone group there in the back. <laughs> and uh, what about uh, the relational interpretation? <laughs> one, two. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be more than two after, after the next talk, after they've heard how awesome it is. Yes, that's two, okay. Modal interpretation. Okay, and now comes a big one. None of the above, slash undecided. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, and twenty-four it is, yes. Finally, 
Now we're going to see how hardcore the many worlders were here. Do you feel comfortable saying that Everettian parallel universes are as real as our universe? Yes, who is for yes? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, <laughs> and fourteen. How many did we have for Everett the first time? Fifteen. So, so one dropped off. <laughs> All right. That's true, that's true, that's true, at least in this universe. So <laughs> I'm glad to see we have a wide range of, of, uh, of views represented here, which is the optimal way to organize a conference. Well done, Simon. Uh, it was, uh, it's been very interesting. I've been doing some informal polls like this for a while, and there's definitely been a time derivative. I did, the first time I did it was in 1997 at a quantum workshop in Maryland, and, and there there were 13 Copenhagen and uh, only 8 Everett, and then dropped off. Uh, this, is Oxford, so. <laughs> this is true, but we have a few different sp spatial locations too. Look at the Harvard poll I did in 2010. Copenhagen was down to zero, and Everett had come out number one, tying with none of the above. And none of the above had a very strong showing here today. Again, can you read off, may I, just the top no, the, the numbers in the, here that you just wrote down again? So you had, in, read them from top to bottom in popularity. None of the above, I think, one, right? Um, With? Yes. 24. Uh, 24. The second one is um, Moscow World. Many worlds, yeah? Um, With how many? 15. Yeah, and, and third place was? Bohm. Was Bohm with? Five. five. Check and normalize. Yeah. So it's 56 in total. That's, that's right. This is a good, po good poll. So what we can see for sure, I think, is there's been a little bit of a shift, I think, towards more open-mindedness away from the, sort of, it used to be 100% Copenhagen, probably, at least if in sort of, sort of very orthodox crowds in the, in the 60s, you know, when Everett tried to get his stuff published. And now we see both Bohm and Everett are doing much better now than, than, than they were back in the old days here. And uh, why has there been a shift? I, I, I think... It's clear that even though the basic question is the same, the context of the whole debate has changed in many ways, right? There's much more awareness now of decoherence and all the nice lab work that goes with that. There's been a real revolution in quantum technology. Last year's Nobel Prize was a fantastic example of what quantum information theory can do now in the lab. So we can't anymore dismiss these things as just philosophy at the same extent. And third, cosmology has also been really transformed. And that's also ch affected the context of this quite a bit in a way which I want to comment on a lot more in the rest of this talk, okay? So why should you care about these questions other than that it's fun to discuss and fun to vote about? Well, my opinion is that the textbook quantum mechanics is either logically inconsistent or it's incomplete, by which I mean that it's unable to make predictions for, for certain experiments that the books I learned quantum mechanics from <coughs> way back, you know, would say these two things. One, all isolated systems evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. And two, when you observe a system, it does not evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. Oops, you know, instead the wave function collapses in some sort of random way as I've tried to illustrate here. So these two were clearly not two things that really play along with each other very well. Uh, uh, to drive that home a little bit, let's just make it a Gedanken experiment. So let's take the Andromeda galaxy, okay? There isn't a whole lot of stuff around it, but let's just to be obsessive, paranoid here, let's pump out all, all stuff within a little buffer around it of thickness a thousand light years, okay? So it's in a complete vacuum, no photons around it. That means it's a perfectly isolated system for the next 1,000 years, okay? So according to postulate one here, this should simply evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. But what if there is some guy living in there? What if life has evolved on one of those planets and they're making an experiment right now? Accor then according to axiom two, it's not evolving according to the Schrodinger equation. So what do we do with this? Right? This is the basic heart of the conundrum which Simon Saunders so eloquently explained in the beginning. Different people have done different things with this. What Everett did 
which is also my, what I like to do is just so I say, okay, let's just cross out the second one. So then we get the cross out the wave function collapse and say everything, all isolated systems of all the according to Schrodinger equation, done. That's all you need to define the theory. Any other interpretation has to come from just studying the math. And then, of course, as Simon nicely showed, by using the math, you can convince yourself that it will actually appear to observers in here as if the wave function collapses when they look at things and the coherence can explain why we don't see all this weirdness, etc., etc. And Simon will talk more about this uh, tomorrow. But there are also other ways, of course, in which other, the other interpretations sort of try to go about this. And let me be a little more clear on, on what I think, taking a step back to more fundamental things than quantum mechanics. Because ultimately, maybe quantum mechanics is just an effective theory that emerges from something else or whatnot. But here are two very basic hypotheses which I buy into. And I want to put my cards on the table so you know what I think. Okay? The first one is what I call the external reality hypothesis. The idea that there really exists an external reality completely independent of us humans. I think it would be very arrogant of me to think that the Andromeda galaxy couldn't exist if I dropped dead tomorrow. I think the Andromedans can get by fine without me, and I don't feel that somehow me and my human language should be necessary for that stuff to exist just fine. This uh, conflicts a bit with, with the cubism that we heard about from Simon Saunders, where, you, where people try to tend to go a little bit more anthropocentric, and at least some of the adherents would say, well, you know, it's all just our human description of things, and everybody can have their own description, but we don't want to talk about any external reality actually having these properties. I want to. I'm a physicist. I, I believe this stuff is out there. I believe it has a description completely independent of me, and I see it as my job as a physicist to try to find that description. Okay. Um, a second hypothesis I also subscribe to is what I'm calling the no-secret sauce hypothesis. So you, you could take the point of view that the mystery is resolved by saying, you know, suppose, for example, in this, over in the Andromeda, there is another person there named Simon, Simon Saunders, and he is an experimentalist instead, as a, a philosopher, and he has a lab. And he makes this experiment, and he makes a spin one-half measurement, and being a gambling man, he bets a thousand quid that it's going to come out spin up. So after the experiment, from our perspective, looking at the Andromeda galaxy from afar, that your, your friend Simon there is in a superposition of, having, of being happy because he won, won a, hun, a thousand Andromeda quid and lost a thousand Andromeda quid, right? And if you believe that there's a sort of secret sauce that, that Simon is not just a product of his particles doing something complicated in his brain, uh, you could say, well, yeah, sure, Simon Saunders's particles are in a superposition of yes and like uh, two, two different positions, but there's also some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, spirit field which is beyond the particles and which is going to determine whether he's conscious or not. And the spirit field is only there in one of the two branches of the superposition. And it's only that Simon who's conscious. And that way you could say maybe um, we can reconcile these things. I don't believe in that kind of dualism. Though. I really think I am my particles. I don't see any convincing evidence that I need to assume that there is any special spirit field or ghost field or whatever. And so I'm stuck in that case with having to say, okay, if, if the particles of Simon Saunders' Andromeda version are in, in these two different configurations, it would be very silly of me to say that one of them is one of those configurations is somehow more real than the other. Okay, so that, that's what I think. Now, why do we, why can't we just brush these problems aside the way some of the earliest quantum mechanics hoped to? Some of the earliest quantum mechanics clearly thought that maybe quantum mechanics is just this weird stuff which applies to the micro world, to the tiny particles. And maybe it doesn't apply to big things. It's clear that little particles can be in two places at once as electrons in, inside of our atoms, etc. But maybe we can confine the weirdness to the micro world. Uh-uh, we cannot. Right? The most famous example of that is Schrodinger's cat, which is an example of an amplification process, where microscopic weirdness 
is amplified into macroscopic weirdness. As we heard from Simon, whether one atom has decayed or not determines whether an entire cat is standing up or, or lying down dead, right? And uh, just to take you more, <coughs> and nature is full of those things. Basically, chaos theory is all about how tiny differences in initial conditions get amplified to macroscopic differences. And whenever you have any kind of nonlinear chaotic dynamics, this happens. Our brain has chaotic dynamics like this. So what individual synapses do in our brain can cause gross differences in our behavior. Uh, <coughs> the world is full of it. We cannot contain the weirdness to the micro world, which is why we have to confront these problems. To focus this a little bit, I want to just uh, bring out another less uh, cruel to animals version of, of Schrodinger's cat which shows this, this kind of amplification of small fluctuations. Let's imagine a playing card balanced exactly on its edge, which we'll take to be infinitesimally thick here, and we'll do this in a perfect vacuum with no vibrations, etc. So classically, this would stay balanced forever. But many of you have, in, in quantum homework, in grad school, figured out what happens in quantum mechanics, where you conclude that actually, because of the uncertainty principle, it's a little bit fuzzed out in its position. It will fall down in superposition of being into both to the left and to the right at once. Right? So if you, just like Simon's friend in the, in the Andromeda Galaxy, have bet money now, a thousand quid on, on this falling down with a face up, with a queen upwards, and you look at this, then what's going to happen as soon as you look at it is you're going to be happy in the branch of the wave function where it fell down, and you're going to be unhappy and the other one, and this tiny uncertainty in the initial position of the card has been amplified into your whole mental state, all the particles in your brain being in two states at once. And if you, if you look at this sort of cartoon style here, we start up here, up here thinking, oh, I hope I win, eyes closed. Now the ca card is in a superposition of two places at once, but your brain, the particles in your brain are not, because your eyes are still closed, and you don't know yet. Now you open your eyes, you join the superposition, like Simon said, the superpositions tend to spread. And because of decoherence, those two branches can never interact again. And for all practical purposes, we can think of this as our whole classical world having sp split out into these two different branches. I'm just giving a very, very brief recap again of some of Everett's core ideas that I'm going to need for the argument I'm going to make next. And then you'll hear a more detailed discussion of of, of probabilities and such from Simon tomorrow. Okay? So how do you get probabilities out of this? Simon will talk much more about it tomorrow, but the basic idea that Everett introduces is that, well, suppose you just repeat this exact same experiment lots of times. Suppose we do it four times. Well, then there are 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 equals 16 possible ways in which the cards can fall, right? As illustrated by the 16 quadruplets of cards that I've drawn here. There's one outcome where all four are down, one here where all four are up. There are four different ways in which you could have had one card up, and there are six ways in which you could have had 50% of the cards up. So that the most, and these 16 parallel worlds that you get effectively, the most common kind is where you get 50% up and down. If you repeat it 400 times instead of four times, this probability distribution gets more and more peaked around the center. This is, of course, the binomial distribution, which starts to look kind of Gaussian. And, and you get the vast majority now of all of these branches, that now the 2 to the 400 branches, being ones where it's about 50% of the time spin up, 50% of the spin down. You ever had pointed out that if you, if you just write down a 0 every time you, you lose, and you write down 1 every time you win, then every sequence of outcomes can be written down as a sequence of zeros and ones. Just put a decimal point in front of this now. And if you, what you have written out is basically a number written out in binary, right? 0 0.110111. And if you do this forever, any sequence of outcomes just corresponds to a number on the real number line between 0 and 1. And there's a famous mathematics theorem by a mathematician named Borel from about a century ago who proved that almost all real numbers have half of their decimals zero and half of their decimals one. You all know that from when you were a kid and played with your calculator and took square roots and stuff, that the decimals look kind of random. And he formalized that. 
and said that almost all num real numbers have a totally random looking decimal expansion, where almost all is very rigorous, meaning actually all except for those of, a, of Lebesgue measure zero. And, and this, this made a big impression on the mathematicians at the time, because before Borel, a lot of mathematicians thought that probability theory and statistics was kind of flaky. It wasn't really as cool as the rest of mathematics because they talked about all this philosophy stuff and r randomness, whereas mathematics was supposed to be rigorous. But Borel's theorem actually managed to sneak all of the theorems of statistics in through the back door. So mathematicians could no longer complain about them because you could just always replace every instance of the word probability by just some statement about something being measure zero and blah, blah. And uh, that made a big impression on mathematicians at the time. And it, I think it's interesting that Everett sneaks probability into physics in exactly the same way that, that Borel snuck probability into mathematics. By saying that really, as soon as you have an ensemble of many things, then almost all elements of this ensemble are going to have these properties which seem kind of random. All right, so you'll hear a lot more about this tomorrow from Simon, and th but this is Everett's explanation for how, why it is that we perceive probabilities even if there's nothing random. And there's only one big pro nuisance with this. This argument works very nicely when the probabilities are exactly 50%. Simon will show you how you can also make them work from decision theory when they're not 50%. But my friend and colleague, Anthony Aguirre, who I just learned coincidentally is actually, I guess, my cousin, right? Because we have the same academic grandfather, sort of, David Laser. He used to be like a thorn in my side about this. But when there are unequal probabilities, then, in this, suppose you put this playing card in a position a little bit tilted initially, so you get, you know, one over squared of three amplitude that is going to go to the left. You still get exactly two to the power n outcomes. But now somehow all these different worlds aren't quite equally real. Some worlds are supposed to be a little bit more real than others, corresponding to somehow the, the norm of their, of their wave function. And it's just, it reminded me too much of Animal Farm, honestly. And this didn't feel quite as evident, elegant. And, and I kept thinking, wouldn't it be cool if there's some way of thinking about these parallel worlds so you can think of them as actually existing for real? equally much, so <laughs> each world is equally real, so you can just kind of count worlds to get probabilities, right? Because that's what Everett did. You just, you just counted for the, for the equal probability case. You just count all the outcomes and you say, okay, and almost all of them is 50% up, right? Well, what I want to show you now is that yes, there is such a way actually, but to make that work, you have to marry quantum mechanics with some recent developments in cosmology Surprise, surprise. So let's turn to cosmology briefly. We already heard from Anthony Valentini about the Planck satellite. And uh, the, the great progress we've had in cosmology, which has really transformed the field since I first started studying it together as with Joe Silk as my advisor, has really put on a much firmer footing this idea that we live in a, in a space which has expanded for the last 14 billion years. And we have, we have a very firm understanding of what's happened, at least during these 14 billion years. So we start to take cosmology more seriously. Now, what happened earlier, we don't know, but the most popular theory, certainly among my cosmology colleagues, is inflation. It predicts a lot of great stuff that made people happy. It predicts that space should be very flat. I've personally worked on measuring this, and we've measured that it's flat to better than 1%. Great. Uh, it predicts that there should be these fluctuations in the density field that we heard about from Anthony Valentini that should be almost scale invariant, and we've checked, and yes, they are almost scale invariant, great. Predicts a lot of things. But then it also predicts more stuff than, than people had originally asked of it. it. It predicts generically that space isn't just big, but actually infinite, because it became, was shown by Alex Vilenkin and Andre Linde and others that generically inflation produces a truly infinite volume of space. And uh, <laughs> that gives us another multiverse, which gives us infinitely many galaxies, stars, planets, ultimately. 
Uh, but not elsewhere in Hilbert space now, like Everett had it in his 1957 quantum multiverse, but there are actually in other places just in this space. All we're saying is if space goes on forever, and if in each region of space things started out with the particles in a sort of random way, which is inflation, what inflation says, then as long as the probability isn't zero that you're going to form something like Earth, which it can't be since we're here, it'll happen in other places too. And um, in a, to try to reduce confusion of people mixing up different multiverses, I, I, I like to call uh, the, this kind, the simplest kind, the level one multiverse, because ultimately it's older. It goes back to Giordano Bruno, who was burnt at the stake for it in 1600. John Barrow has written on, about it quite a bit also, but fortunately with a better faith than, than Bruno. <laughs> and uh, there are some intriguing similarities between these two multiverses. Level three is what I'm calling the quantum one. And level two is, is um, parts which are of our, still our same space, which are still farther away, which where um, the effective laws of physics might be different for reasons you can ask me about afterwards. But if we just compare these two, and both of these multiverses have an ensemble where the laws of physics seem to be the same. And both of them, you would learn the same things always in physics class, but you would learn different things in history class because the particles started out in different places, the solar systems formed differently, history was a bit different. So if, for example, in the Everett interpretation, you know, this guy asks this woman if she wants to go out for a drink, and then there's some amplification of some micro-superposition in her brain, which makes her say either yes or no, and then you get macroscopically different outcomes here. In fact, even if Everett is wrong and there are no level three multiverses, parallel universes, there will be another planet really, really far away in our ordinary space, which according to Andre Linde has the other outcome anyway. So it, I'm not asking you to take seriously that space is infinite, but I'm asking you to just bear with me for five or 10 minutes now and, and say, suppose space is infinite. Okay, like the simplest inflation models predict. What does that imply for quantum mechanics, okay? Let's just see where that goes. And I want to show you that it goes somewhere very surprising. So let's say that on this planet here, we do with a, simple, a very simple quantum experiment. We take a silver atom, spin one half system, send it through a stern gorlock apparatus to measure its spin, whether it's up or down, and we start it off with an amplitude alpha being spin down, beta being spin up. Now Born, Max Born said, well, the probability of getting spin up is just the absolute value of beta squared, the Born rule. Let's do this under the assumption that inflation made an infinite space. That means that, it, that there are also all, a bunch of other planets where there is also some guy who feels his max tech mark, who has up until now had exactly the same memories and feels subjectively indistinguishable from me. He's doing the same experiment. What happens? Well, we can use just standard quantum mechanics to figure this out. Now we have this initial state of the wave function. It's just a tensor product of the same wave function over and over. There are now eight possibilities here, right? Two times two times two. Ultimately, the spin could come up down in all three, on all three planets, up on all three, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And uh, we can again say, okay, what's the probability I'm gonna measure that the spin is up? It better give the same answer as before. It shouldn't be that Andre Linde should somehow modify the predictions of quantum mechanics. So I should get P somehow at the end. Well, when you actually write out what happens, you just do the usual Born rule on these amplitudes. That's the usual quantum part. But the only way you're going to get the right answer is if you also put in another little factor here. Big N is, is 3 in this example, which just counts on how many planets did it actually come in, uh, and how many, how many maxes are there measuring each outcome. That's what that term is doing. So for example, if, if you have this outcome, spin up on two planets, spin down on the third, there are three maxes who are going to be measuring this. I don't know which one I am, right? They all feel the same before they look at the measurement. So all I can say is, well, there's one third chance that I'm this max, so that would be spin up. There's one third chance that I'm that max, spin up, and also one third chance that I'm that guy. 
That's what this little extra factor is. This gives the right answer when you combine it all together. And what's kind of funny about this is you're combining actually Born's quantum probabilities here with the classical probabilities of Laplace now, where you're just saying, you know, I made a measurement. I just don't know which of the three maxes I am. So I'm going to, because I have no knowledge about this, it's equally likely that I'm any of the three. I'm going to assign equal probability to the three. Right? That's how Laplace introduced gambling to the French noblemen way back when they paid people like Laplace to develop probability theory to not lose so much money at parties. Now, if you look at this a little bit more carefully, what, what I did in this paper with Anthony Aguirre was so we, define, I, we define something we call the confusion operator. And I apologize, this is the only, pretty almost the only slide which is going to have about a bunch of more hardcore math which is an operator which measures whether I'm confused or not. What it basically does is, if we, if we take the limit now, we, let's say we have much more planets than three, a billion or, or more. The confusion operator equals one in those branches of the wave function where I get confused, wh where the fraction of all, all the planets that get spin up departs a lot from, from what the Born rule should have predicted. So for example, if the Born rule predicted one-third probability of spin-up, right? Everett says all the outcomes actually happen. On all the, on all the uh, branches of the wave function where, it's, where the fraction of spin-up is, is differing from a third by more than some small number epsilon, the confusion operator gives one, otherwise it gives zero, okay? And that's all the details we need to know. We were able to prove this theorem by using something called Huffing's inequality. Which, and, and what it says in plain English is actually very, very easy to, uh, to interpret. It says that I if you do a quantum measurement in the kind of space which Andre Linde and Alan Guth and so on tell us that they think we live in, an infinite space made by inflation, then as long as we neglect the wave function component of, of as long as we say the two wave functions are equal, if if the only difference between them has measure zero, which is just part of the definition of Hilbert space anyway, so it's not much of an assumption, then, in fact, one gets a superposition of, of states which are all indistinguishable. Let me explain what I mean by that, because it's a little bit shocking, okay? Uh, let's start with the picture up on the left side, okay? Old school, before Everett and before, Alan, before inflation. There's only one Earth. I don't know what I'm going to see. I make the measurement. I either get happy because I won my bet or sad because I lost, okay? In the cosmological picture, there are, I'm on all these different planets here beforehand. I don't know which one I'm on because all of these maxes feel the same. And then Everett says there's no collapse, so I'm going to get a superposition of, of situations in space each corresponding to one of these strips here, okay? Either I'm sad on the first planet, happy on the next two, and then sad on the fourth, etc. Or I'm in the quantum branch where I'm happy on the first three, and then I'm sad, etc. There are all these different possibilities, okay? And what this theorem says is actually all of these different outcomes, that outcome in space, or that outcome, or that outcome, are all indistinguishable. Because in every single one of them, I'm happy exactly on one-third of the planets. So I'm, I'm happy on two-thirds of the planets. I'm unhappy on one-third of them. So that's kind of remarkable. Because usually, if you just make a measurement on one planet, right, I can get th with this outcome or that come, and the outcomes are different. Here, we're seeing that actually, you get a superposition of all these outcomes, but they're all the same. So it actually doesn't matter, really, ultimately, whether the wave function collapses or not here. Because if you just pick one of these cases, you can't tell the difference between that and any of the other ones. Another interesting thing about it is that it gives you a very natural way of, of thinking about what that probability means. Because uh, there, is, there is 
a space, and there are all these planets with these parallel maxes. They're not off in Hilbert space now. They're just different places far, far away in this space. And uh, on one third of them, I lost the bet, and on two thirds of them, I won the bet. I don't know which of them I am, so it totally makes sense to say that I'm going to bet two thirds, probably, that I'm, I'm winning this thing. This is exactly the way Laplace introduced probabilities to French card players. If you have a hand, and it is, you know, there are three ways it could be, you don't know which, give them one third probability each. Okay. Another interesting thing about this is uh, I think it gives you an interesting sort of uh, face-saving opportunity for both Copenhagen and for Everett. Because the Copenhagenists can say, well, to the Everettians, it didn't really matter whether the, that the wave function didn't collapse, because all of these different branches are actually indistinguishable. On the other hand, the face-saving for the Everettians is that the Copenhagenists who just wanted to collapse to get rid of those darned parallel universes, to get rid of those other planets they didn't like, they failed. Because if inflation happened, you, ha you have all these other parallel versions of your life anyway to start with. <laughs> and then if the measurement collapses the wave function, now you still have all these parallel outcomes. So Copenhagen, the collapsing wave function doesn't succeed in getting rid of any parallel world either. Finally, this gives actually an, in a, way, a different way of interpreting quantum uncertainty. We, we heard earlier in Anthony Valentini's nice talk that he interprets it as, as noise left over from this, uh, this uh, relaxation process. Here, the quantum uncertainty is simply uncertainty about where you are in space. Which of the many U's you are in this indexical information about which of the many indistinguishable people you correspond to. So the un this, there is no fictitious ensemble. There's a real ensemble, actually, of actual planets. They're just really, really far away from here, which the wave function is describing. And finally, if you feel uncomfortable about having a really infinite space, you don't actually need to, because it turns out that this key requirement, that this fraction of confused branches has to go to zero, it becomes doubly exponentially small. So even well, it's a pretty big universe that inflation easily gives you, for all practical purposes, you get exactly the same conclusions. So what I want to do now is take a step back. I've inflicted on you the most uh, painful technical part of the talk with the math, and come back to discussing the basic question here, how to, what to make of the interpretation of quantum mechanics. You've told me what you thought. I've told you what I thought. And I, I think a very interesting question, which um, Simon encouraged me to write about in this book that he advertised, is of the many worries and concerns and complaints people have about the Everett interpretation, which ones of those are actually unique to quantum mechanics? And which one of them, of them really don't have anything to do with quantum mechanics? And what I hope to convince you is that actually most of the complaints don't really have anything to do with quantum mechanics. So it's very nice to sort of separate out specifically what these worries are. So I made a list here of, of all of the worries that people have told me so far in my career about the many worlds interpretation. I want to just quickly go through them one by one. The, a very popular worry is that somehow parallel universes are wasteful. So if you're, if you're into Occam's razor, you might say, I don't like parallel worlds. It seems unnecessarily complicated. Okay. I think part of the reason that Everett was hit hard by this core critique was because he was the first person in the 1900s who was really pushing parallel universes. All the inflation stuff and the string theory stuff came later. So Everett kind of took this flack for, for it. It's just like the oldest sibling always gets <laughs> flack. And then the younger sibling comes along and gets to do everything the older one has done earlier. Now, you know, parallel universes are everywhere. And we're not just talking about Everett. We're talking about the inflationary ones, level one, level two, et cetera. Huge acrimony about this, of course. There are some scientists I respect a lot, like Paul Steinhardt, who would say, oh, this isn't science. And then there are others I respect, like Alex Vilenkin, who would say, oh, parallel universes, it's inevitable. You know, and sometimes people 
even disagree with their thesis advisor. I think I agree with mine here, but, but uh, for example, Frank Wilczek is kind of into many worlds and David Gross says, I hate it. At least Randall, I think pretty open to them. The inflation got pioneers here are generally pretty open to them too. And so before we talk about the wastefulness more, where are these parallel universes that people talk about, just to bring us all on the same page? The level ones they talked about are just far away in space, in three-dimensional space. The level two ones, which I mentioned just super briefly in passing, are infinitely far away in the same space, in the sense that there is space between us and them that's still inflating, so we can never get there, even if we travel at the speed of light, even though they're still part of our same space. The Quantum ones are in some sense elsewhere in Hilbert space, of course, and then there's an even bigger multiverse where I'm in maybe a minority of one <laughs> believing in, which I'll talk a bit af about after dinner tomorrow, where they are, those worlds are sort of elsewhere in some platonic math space. But let's come back to the wastefulness argument against, well, against parallel universes and against Everett. As you can see here, the gist is that Occam rejects things which are too complicated. Right? He's not rejecting these razors or whatever because there's too much space in them. It's the, comp it's the complexity that bothers him. He wants things to be simple. So let's talk a little bit about the, specifically the complexity. But what is the complexity of our universe? How complicated is it? Well, the entropy is about 10 to the power 89 bits. That's a lot of information. So what is that information really telling us? At MIT, a lot of my students like to wear these t-shirts with equations. And I'm sure they're popular here in Oxford, too, when it's warm. How much of that information, of those 10 to the 89 bits, have to go on the t-shirts? Well, for example, we t teach our kids that there are eight planets in our solar system. Does that number eight have to go on the t-shirt that's supposed to give the theory of everything? No, because we know there are many solar systems. Some have four planets, some have one, zero, you know, this one has eight. So the eight isn't telling us anything fundamental about nature, it's just telling us part about our address in nature, right? What about this? This is a lot of data, 50 megabytes of Planck data. Does that need to go on a t-shirt? No, because if space is infinite, or even just very, very big, all possible Planck maps would be observed from some appropriate vantage point in space. Right? If we go somewhere else, we'll see a different pattern. So this, these 50 gigabytes are also just telling us a bit more about our address, where in space we built the Planck satellite and observed from. What if we do a, a, storm, a quantum random number generator? That's how Anthony Aguirre and I decided who was going to be first author and second author on the paper. We figured we would both be first authors somewhere in the Everett multiverse. So we use a quantum random number generator. And, and uh, if you generate a long sequence of zeros and ones like this, should those numbers go on that t-shirt with a theory of everything? Well, if you're an Everettian, no. Because that's not anything fundamental about our universe either. It's just telling you where you are in Hilbert space, effectively, your address in the Everett multiverse. What about all of these numbers? We can describe every number ever measured in physics we can calculate it from these 32 numbers, in principle. Uh, do they need to go there? Well, according to string theory, no. At least according to the dream of, of many string theories, they are just geometric properties that tell you about the particular vacuum state that we're in. And then they argue about whether they're actually 10 to the 500 of them. But in, uh, in either case, they don't go on a t-shirt, right? They just specify where you are in this, in this bigger reality. So what's left to put on the t-shirt? Well, if, if string theory is correct, maybe you should put the equations of string theory or loop quantum gravity or, or whatever the true theory is. That's really all that you need to put there. That's very simple. Occam would like that. If, uh, if my level four multiverse exists, then even universes corresponding to those different fundamental t-shirts also exist, so you can actually just have a blank t-shirt. <laughs> Maybe Occam would like that even more, but w w one way or the other, my point is, this argument that, um, oh, I don't like Everett because it's too complicated, 
can actually be turned around, I think, to an argument for Everett and for multiverses, because I would argue that it's actually s simpler to have a bigger reality. If what we observe, in other words, whether it's 10 to the 89 bits, you know, if that requires much more bits to describe than the complete mathematical description that you're all hoping to find, that are all, or, or immediately means that we're living in some kind of multiverse. Right? You can't describe 10 to the 89 uncompressible bits with, with fewer than that. So I think this Occam worry about, if you like simplicity, I actually think that a bigger reality is simpler. What about the next worry here? The business of, uh, of unequal, of, of probab where probabilities come from. How do you get randomness from a causal theory? Well, we'll hear a lot more about that from Simon tomorrow, but I just want to make the point that you don't need quantum mechanics even to get randomness out of something which fundamentally isn't random. This is Philip, for example, who, my son who just turned 14. If we, if we snatch him when he's a little bit younger here, so he doesn't protest, and we put him into this cloning device while he's sleeping, and we make two copies of him, okay? And then we put him, we put one copy in room, in the, the, the in, a, in a room with a big sign that says zero on it, and we put another copy of Philip in a room with a sign that says one, okay? And we've told Philip ahead of time exactly what we're gonna do with him. And we ask him ahead of time, what do you think is the first thing you're going to see when you wake up? Are you going to see a zero or a one? What's he going to say? He knows that there's going to be one version of him that's going to see a zero, and then there's going to be another version of him which is going to feel exactly identical in all ways, all the same memories, all the same memories of arguments with his dad, everything, except he's going to see a one. Because both of these will feel exactly like Philip, right? So all he, the, the best thing he can say before, we, before he goes to sleep is it's going to feel to him random. It's going to feel like he sees a random number, 0 or 1, with 50% probability. If we ask him to bet money after he wakes up, before he's looked at the sign, that would be the right odds for him to give, right? Yet there is nothing random at all in this. We could even watch the whole thing through one-way mirrors and see the two Phillips, right? So the point here is that Cloning, observer cloning, feels to the observer like subjective randomness. Very simple, has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. If we repeated this experiment many, many times, and Philip wrote, and each copy of Philip wrote down the whole sequence of room numbers he woke up in, it would look like a very long random sequence, eventually, like this, right? And the point here is that quantum mechanics is one example of a way that you can clone people. The wave function, as we'll hear more from Simon tomorrow, Quantum evolution tends to create these branches where you have observers in both of them that have the same memories. Uh, if, in fact, if you were AIs, if you were simulated in some kind of computer, or if one of you goes home and creates a computer program smart enough to be self-aware, it would find this very self-evident because programs can e easily be copied, right? And if you start making bets with your program, it, it would know that every time you make a copy of itself and show one one thing, one the other, it's going to feel subjectively sort of random to it. And uh, as we saw, even if in an infinite space, there are also, if there are copies of you who feel that the same up until this point, and then something different is going to happen to them tomorrow, that will feel random. So no, uh, the business about getting something that feels random is from a causal deterministic theory is not something intrinsically quantum mechanical at all. The only thing special is that quantum mechanics is one of the many theory ways in which you can clone people. What about unequal probabilities? Well, that's the part which is you very uniquely quantum, right? That's what this cosmological interpretation business was about that I shared with you, and we'll hear more from, from uh, Simon about it tomorrow. It's the first thing on our list so far, the quibbles people have, that is actually specific to quantum mechanics. What about this one? The invisibility worry. You know, if all these parallel worlds are there, why don't we ever see them? at least while we're sober, you know, and, and what selects the preferred basis? That's a more technical issue. Why is it that I tend to see things either here or there? If I put them in a superposition of here plus there, for example, why, why aren't the things that we see here plus there or here minus there? 
the good news is that both of those are actually solved. They are quantum specific, but that's exactly what decoherence does for you. And I don't want to dwell on it because I want to leave time for questions, but as has been shown by Tsei and Zurich and, and many others, if you just take the Schrodinger equation with nothing else at all, this effect pops out there. It's a sort of censorship effect that whenever the environment of something finds out its quantum state, that quantum superposition is, for all practical purposes, destroyed. And um, even if you can shield your system completely from the environment, so it's in some funky super Schrodinger cat-like superposition, you can still never experience that because to experience it, you need to get the information into your brain. Your brain has neurons in it in a warm, wet place. And I once calculated that you know, when, when your neuron, even if one single neuron in your brain is in a superposition of firing and not firing, it means that at that instant, you have a order a million sodium ions, which are in a superposition of being in two places at once. And these are charged particles which interact with like, all sorts of other ions and water molecules, and that decoheres in ten, less than 10 to the minus 20 seconds. So I don't know, maybe you think that fast, <laughs> but I certainly don't. So what this means is that even if you could build some perfect quantum shirt in your cat, as soon as you look at it, just the decoherence in your brain itself would, would, would spoil the effect. And you should always feel kind of classical. So yes, I put this in green. This is uniquely quantum, but this is actually solved. We now get to the final worry, I wanna, which I think is probably, the, in a way, the most pernicious and the one that people get the most upset about, usually in debates. And um, I was jo we were joking earlier, that, uh, as I said, at Wojtek Zurich's birthday celebration, Ray Laflamme, who organized the meeting, conjectured that he is actually a closet many world person. And Wojtek said, well, I just define, define the word exists differently than you. He said, I define exist to be something that we can observe. So then by definition, something which is outside of our Hubble volume, for example, doesn't exist. And, and then other people choose to argue about what, to, what they mean by the word exists, or, sorry, the word real, or the word is. I don't want to get into American politics here, but <laughs> some of you will remember. And then there's a related issue about things being weird. So th th but these, these words quibble, to me, really, what it boils down to is, what are you more comfortable with? Many worlds or, or many words? I feel that Occam's razor said, <laughs> if the mathematics is simple, that's what really matters. But sometimes, but there are certainly a lot of colleagues of mine who disagree with this and, and prefer to go to great lengths, writing very complicated special definitions of words and things, to somehow try to get rid of the many worlds. And just to be, brings a little bit of clarity to this, I've tried to sort of summarize these words that, that many worlds critics use and say, what are the basic <laughs> principles, really, that are enshrined in them? And I think it boils down to some combination of these three things. So these are the three philosophical villains. There are three assumptions which are often used either one or two or three in combination to attack Everett or, or other parallel universes. And I, the first one I call the omnivision assumption. It's the assumption that physical reality must be such that at least one observer can in principle observe all of it. Okay? I think it's a little bit of a strange assumption, sort of like an ostrich with his head in the sand saying, if I can't see it, then it doesn't exist. But this is sort of what it's saying. And, and, and this would be my, so when Wojtek Zurich says that he d redefines exist to be what you can observe, you know, in a way, I think he uh, would subscribe to the omnivision assumption. Then the second one is what I call the pedagogical reality assumption, which is the assumption that physical reality must be such, you know, that all reasonably informed human observers feel that they intuitively can understand it. Everybody is entitled to, have, be, to make these assumptions. That's fine. I feel, personally, very little sympathy for either of these two, because I feel both of them are quite arrogant and sort of place me as a human in ver some very central place in the cosmos, which feels sort of anti-Copernican. You know, why should the universe care about whether I can observe it or not, if there is this stuff which exists? 
it would seem sort of hubristic to me that there should be some law of nature that says I have to be able to see it all. But if I can't see it all, even in principle, then by definition already, I've acknowledged that there can be parallel universes, right? So that's a very strong assumption, the omnivision assumption. And the pedagogical reality stuff, I'll get back to that in a moment, but it's basically the assumption that it's sort of tantamount to saying that if a theory feels too weird, it must be wrong. And finally, there's a no copy assumption, which is the assumption that there's no physical process that can ever copy observers or create subjectively indistinguishable observers. Because as we saw, as soon as you allow cloning of you, right, then you're going to get what feels like probabilities. So to really, if you really want to get rid of parallel universes, you really should, you have to buy into at least some of this stuff, I would argue. And, and that's the choice. So let me, let's, let me talk a little bit about the, the middle one now, that just finally, in my last few minutes, the pedagogical reality assumption, the assumption that real, the true nature of reality must not feel weird to us. Well, I think if we buy into that, we're just not taking this guy seriously enough. So which famous Brit is this? Charles Darwin, right? He said something about this, actually. He said that we have our intuition, or he would have said if you were here, I think, we have our intuition precisely for those things that were useful for our ancestors. We have great intuition for the parabolic orbit of flying rocks, because those of our ancestors who didn't got cleaned out of the gene pool. Okay? Conversely, if, we, if there was some cave woman who spent too long thinking very much in detail about what happens to things which were trillions of times smaller than a human being, she might not notice that there was a tiger sneaking up from behind and she would be cleaned out of the gene pool. So we predict that whenever we go beyond the human scale using technology to measure things that our ancestors had no knowledge of, right, we sh our intuition should break down. That's nice because that's a testable prediction. So what does the test show? Well, we've, we've tested what happens when you look at things which go much faster than humans could go, than our ancestors could go. Time slows down. That's pretty weird. We've measured what happens when things are much more massive than our ancestors had any access to. We get black holes. That's pretty weird. We've tested what happens when, when you uh, look at things much smaller than the human scale, and we see that particles can be in multiple places at once. That feels pretty counterintuitive and weird, doesn't it? We've looked much colder than the human scale. We get liquid helium flowing upward. That's pretty funky and weird. We've looked at things much hotter or much higher energy collisions than, than uh, the human scale, and we can collide together, for example, protons at the Large Hadron Collider, and get out a Higgs, get out a Higgs boson and a bunch of other stuff. To me, that's about as intuitive as, as colliding together a Volkswagen and an Audi, you know and out pops two trains in a cruise ship. Yet, this is exactly what Darwin's prediction says, right? Whenever we use technology to probe beyond the human scale, our intuition should break down. So I feel that whatever the true theory of everything may be, we can say with great confidence it's going to feel weird. And if we just reject everything that feels weird, because we subscribe slavishly to the pedagogical reality assumption, we're going to reject, we're not going to be the ones to discover that correct theory. So I want to just give the last word to uh, one of my great physics heroes, Richard Feynman. So the sort of strongest form of the anthropic principle, as it were, might be to say that our universe must be such that we like it. <laughs> and uh, he, here's what he had to say about that. Then there's a kind of thing that you don't understand it, meaning I don't believe it, it's too crazy, it's the kind of thing I just, I'm not going to accept it. Uh, well, the other part, well, this kind, I hope you'll come along with me, I don't have to accept it. Because it's the way nature works, if you want to know the way nature works, we looked at it carefully, look at me, that's the way it looks. You don't like it, go somewhere else. <laughs> to another universe where the rules are simpler. Thank you. <laughs>